Hello, friends. I'm Kathy Fay, Executive Director of the Boston Early Music Festival, or BEMF, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this very special pre-concert talk preparatory to our annual concert by the incomparable vocal ensemble, the Talis Scholars, taking place on Friday, December 9th at 8 p.m. in the exquisite St. Paul Church in Harvard Square, Cambridge, Massachusetts. In just a minute, I'll turn the microphone over to my two guests, Peter Phillips, founder and director of the Talis Scholars, and Edward Jones, university organist and choir master at the Memorial Church at Harvard University. But before I do, Peter and I have enjoyed keeping track of the number of performances by the Talis Scholars on the BEMF concert stage over the year. And if my records are correct, the upcoming concert represents the 54th consecutive performance. Benf and the Talis Scholars have had a long and wonderful partnership and friendship for over three decades, and their annual stop on the Benf concert stage has become a truly cherished tradition. As the very proud presenter of the Talis Scholars, every single season for the past 34, sometimes offering two different appearances in a single season, and as was the case during the last two seasons, offering specially filmed virtual performances due to COVID. Let me just say how much I'm looking forward to welcoming the Talis Scholars in person on Friday, December 9th. Peter and the singers have prepared a very special program for Benth audiences titled Hymns to the Virgin, focusing on the inspiring and exquisite music written to honor and invoke the Virgin Mary. We look forward to hearing more about that program in just a minute. Tickets for our concert by the Talis Scholars are still available and can be purchased online by visiting the BEMF website at bemf.org or by calling the BEMF office at 617-661-1812. That's 617-661-1812. For those unwilling or unable to attend our performance in person on Friday, December 9th, virtual tickets are on sale as well. Our virtual presentation premieres on Friday, December 16th, and will be available for a two week period from December 16th through December 30th. So with that, I will now disappear from the screen and turn the discussion over to Peter Phillips and Edward Jones. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much, Kathy. Lovely to see you. And welcome, Peter Phillips. It's so lovely to chat with you once again uh, on your first return visit to Boston uh, since pre-COVID times. And I wanted to just, A, welcome you back. It's so lovely to have you and your group uh, back with us again, a beloved, cherished part of our holiday traditions here in Boston. But wanted to ask you about COVID, what you were up to during that time, any lessons that we've learned from it in terms of singing? Any, I think we all agree Zoom choir is not the greatest thing on earth, um, but any lessons positively that we have learned from it? We avoided those Zoom choir thing. We didn't do any of that. Good idea. Uh, we just stopped singing for 17 months. And when we came back to it, there was no big rustiness in the system. I mean, we just, we were so happy to be back on stage and the, the public, um, were very receptive, should we say? It was very actually. It was very exciting. It was an exciting time. Towards the end, it was we got more and more impatient, but it it mm -hmm. it really burst out. And this year has been incredibly busy. Yeah, just back. I'm very, I'd like to say I'm very very grateful to Cassie and the Boston people for um, keeping with us. That we recorded two video concerts mm -hmm. in London, which were broadcast in some way. Yeah, and that was two years worth. Yeah. We thought we might get there this time last year, but it, it was that sort of revival of some other strange it all, it all kicked in at December last year again, didn't it? Yeah. Yes. We're super grateful, as I say, to have you back. And you have a big birthday coming up next year, the 50th yeah. of Alice Scholars. Congratulations. Yes. Hey, can you tell us about your celebrations? Yes. I, I mean, we're, you know, I'd like some of you people out there to come to this event. Um, it's going to be in Middle Temple Hall in London. Uh, this is the hall that Shakespeare's uh, Twelfth Night was first performed in. 
and it wasn't bombed, so it was the, absolutely the space that Shakespeare knew. So that's a nice tie-up, and it's a very beautiful hall, and I think the sound in there is very nice. So we're we're going to do a. It's not really a concert. It's um, we're not going to have seating exactly. We're, we we want to meet people. Mm. So uh, we're hoping that we'll mingle and and talk to people who are interested to meet us. Put it like that. So that's a kind of different kind of party, but it it should be terrific. What well, that sounds fantastic. Of course, God willing, when you come back next year, then you'll have been you'll be in your fiftieth celebration year. And there are big other big anniversaries. I mean, bird is coming up. Do you have lots of that planned next year? We have a wonderful bird plan. Um, I'm most that's wonderful. Yes, he was as you know he was at Lincoln Cathedral, um, and on the day that he died, which was the fourth of July, they're going to unveil a plaque on the floor of Lincoln Cathedral, and the Talis scholars are joining the cathedral choir, which my son incidentally sang in. Um, for a joint even song and then a concert, and we'll be there in the hot spot. Right there. Of the bird event. Fantastic. And we're going to do that, <laughs> those big pieces. We're going to do the, the nine part. Oh, fabulous. Yeah. Which yeah. will sound glorious in that acoustic. It's just a mess. <laughs> Lincoln <laughs> Cathedral is the best. That is architecturally, it's just a miracle. Absolute gem. Fantastic. So let's move to the programme that you're bringing um, to Boston. It's a Marian programme, music, um, music inspired, devoted to the Virgin Mary, um, which I think is the link. It's I think you're right by the Feast of the Immaculate Conception, but it's not a it's not a Christmas programme. I mean, it goes through the liturgical year. Um, in terms yeah, of I mean, it's not liturgical at all. Mm. My way of getting round year after year after year, of getting round having to sing carols, um, which we're not really equipped to do in that way, yeah, uh, or services of any kind. I mean, we are a concert giving body, mm. not not a religious body, but um, you know, Christmas that one associates with the Virgin Mary. So, I've chosen some variety of pieces from uh, across the centuries actually in this case we're singing some um some pet yeah i thought um, maybe we could talk about that as the sort oh, of yeah. slight outlier in terms of um, a contemporary composer amongst many who have not been around for a long time so can you talk a little bit about the piece your relationship with pet i know you know him and i know you've commissioned yeah. him before um and about this piece and then how it ties in with the rest of the program yes it's a very interesting tie-up um I was privileged actually to, I was invited to conduct at his birthday celebrations this this September, September the 11th, I think is his birthday. And in Tallinn in Estonia, they have a, a big festival every year now because he's getting older. I mean, he won't go on forever. And uh, I conducted there and he's, he is now quite frail actually. Mm. But um, on a previous visit, he had handed me a copy of this piece, Virgen Cita it's called, mm. and he wrote it for Mexico for a, a shrine to the Virgin in Guadalupe in, in Mexico. They're having some special event. Mm. And he wrote this piece to pray to the Virgin of Guadalupe to, to save us. And it's just a very great piece of music. Mm. I don't know how he does it. It's, mm. it's like one or two other composers one thinks of in the Renaissance, like Victoria. It looks so simple. Mm. And the simpler it looks, the more effective it is in performance. That's, That's what I call miracle music. There's no yeah, complication in it. Yeah. Extraordinary ability. It, to touches, hear. it touches something a lot deeper inside yes. sort of collective audience. And I think the collective performance as well. I mean, there's something very almost zen-like about the way that music works on the performers as well as on the audience. Um, well, you know the Victoria Requiem, for example. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's very much in the same category. Yeah. Yeah. There's no complication or fuss. It's just right between the eyes. Yeah. It's deeper than it is wide, somebody once said. Oh, that's terrific. I love that. Yeah. Yeah, that's very true. I mean, there's a verticality to it that actually in terms of emotional verticality rather than just a sort of surface thing. No, I, I, that's I, it. I, I'm not saying that other pieces are just surface, but there is something very magical about those. Well, that's wonderful. Mm. And that certainly keeps it in the tradition of, of the of the programme, both the Marian Link. And I think the Feast of Guadalupe herself is 
is in December 12th, maybe. So we're close to that as well. I know, I know it's not liturgical, but I'm, I always try to make these connections. So apologies. Well, that's your job, Ed. That's my job. It's, it's <laughs> not mine. But it's that's not yours, great. Great. But there we are. We're into it. Um, and then I think, can we move on to the rest of the programme? We've got yeah. a few late Renaissance composers in the forms of Lassus and Guerrero, and then two slightly earlier ones. Just yes. Just, the Josca Mass, of course, is, is, the, is the bulk of, of the programme, really, in, in a single piece. Um, Ave Maris Stella, the, the, the star of the sea, referring to the Virgin. I love that image, actually. It's, it's such particular. a beautiful image, and it's obviously yeah. resonated with many composers because there is something that is in that. I think particularly the imagery of the star of the sea and her sort of comfort level there, but yeah. also with that with that opening. That opening fifth is something that is inspired. Mm -hmm. In fact, we're doing a piece in one of our carol service, a new setting of that by Judith Weir. Which oh, is, yes. But, you know, I'm sure you know yes. that. Well, well, it's a wonderful, yes. wonderful piece. Um, but it just keeps going. That that melody and that imagery just keeps inspiring our poets and our, our composers. It's amazing. Yes, it's a beautiful melody. Yeah. Very modal melody, incidentally. Yes, exactly. Which is, it, it, I mean, we've lost so much by giving up these modes, haven't we? By just having two quite boring ones. But um, <laughs> it's sort of nice that um, that we can go back to that time. And even contemporary composers are still being inspired by those modes. Yes. Wonderful. I wonder if you could tell our listeners what, um, I mean, this is a mass that's based on pre-existing material. Um, can you tell us something about that tradition with Josquin and actually in a slightly wider context as well? Well, Josquin was a past master at this. I mean, um, he's just he has just passed his 500th anniversary of his death. Unfortunately, it was last year in the COVID period. and But that uh, we had a big... Um, uh, project in Berlin um, to do all the masses, 18 of them. Wow. And we did do them this year in July, a year late. But I'm, I'm now a bit of an expert on <laughs> how Josquin used material. And I mean, it's a very long story. We could write a book about what people have. Yeah. But um, I don't know quite how to say this, but I mean, he used different types of model. He used uh, a lot of uh, chant models, obviously. Mm -hmm. But he also used this fascinating business of the solemnization syllables of, of people's names. And I'll just give one example of that, the Hercules Dux Ferrarie. It's our latest record, incidentally. Um, yeah. <laughs> plug. Um, but it's a terrifically exciting piece because Roscan takes the syllables of Her Hercules, there are eight syllables, Hercules Dux Ferrarie, and it turns into a very nice little melody if you do it according to this system of turning vowels into notes mm -hmm. and that because Hercules was obviously quite interested in hearing his own name all the time um it, it just goes round and round and round inside the mass and it then it creates tremendous sort of kinetic energy it's brilliantly done the Hosanna for example he quotes this these eight notes and they get shorter and shorter and shorter until they're absolutely drumming out <laughs> wonderful Hercules must have been very pleased with Josquin I bet, yes. I so. That ego there would have been nurtured. Um, having done all the masses, where does this one lie? Because, I mean, the dating of Josquin's mass is a little tricky in terms of the printings by it's Petrucci. A, exactly. It's almost impossible. I mean, you, how do you... How do you fe feel it is stylistically? Middle. The middle. Yeah. I, I, it's not an early work. Mm -hmm. Those are very obviously late medieval pieces and very exciting to do, but brash, they're sort of brash, medieval rhythms and so on. And not, not a late one, which have become very subtle, more like pal towards Palestrina, that kind of style. Pange Lingua is probably the last. Mm -hmm. This is middle period. It's got, got little bits of old and new in it. He's experimenting with part writing and imitation is the thing that yeah. one's always looking out for. But he uses the tune so well You'll hear it at the beginning of every movement, that fifth you describe, and then the the tone that comes after it, which is the modal element. Yeah, amazing. Uh, yes. Well, it's it's quite clear. I mean, it, anyone can follow this, you know, as yeah. long as they know what, what, what to listen for. It's not difficult to hear. Are you going to sing the chant for people beforehand for them to know? No, we weren't going right, to. So actually. they need to look it up. Look up the Ave Maris Stella chant mm -hmm. exactly before you go. Are there any specific bits in the Mass that you want people to listen out for? There are some canons. I don't know whether people are interested in this kind of mathematical writing, but I'm, I am. I yeah. find it fascinating. There are two canons. They're, they're sung as duets. And uh, when you hear just two voices, solo voices singing, 
then you will know there's a canon going on. It means that one voice is following the other exactly. Mm. But, but of course, they don't sing at the same, they don't start at the same time, they start separately, and they start on different intervals. So there's a canon at the fifth, and I think there's a canon at the second. I think mm. that's how they are in this one, in this mass. Well, that gives a very nice segue of canonic writing to actually several other options we could go for, but maybe we should um, jump a little bit. I thought we'd maybe end talking about the Isaac, um, but maybe jump forward to Guerrero, um, mm. two works by Guerrero, and he obviously does a lot of canons as well. Can you talk a little bit about him? As a, I mean, he's quite an interesting character, isn't he? Life yeah. sort of getting hijacked by pirates and various yeah. things. <laughs> Um, but in terms of his music, this is first, I mean, this is just the pinnacle, isn't it? I mean, the RV. I, I, Guerrero is, is one of these composers like Shepard who got a little bit left behind, quite unfairly, just through historical accident. He's not quite as famous as Victoria, for example, or Morales. Mm -hmm. But actually, he's every bit as good. He, he has this style, and he particularly liked setting texts about the Virgin. He was known as the... Yeah. the singer of, of the Virgin. Yeah. Um, and this uh, Maria Magdalena, the, the first piece we sing in the second half, is, is just a lovely, hummy, euphonious piece of music, beautifully constructed. Mm -hmm. The story in it, actually, of going to the tomb and finding that Jesus isn't there. Yeah. It builds up magnificently. It, it's, it's a narrative, actually. It's amazing. It's, and, then, and then when the stranger in quotation says, who are you looking for? Yeah. It just time stops, doesn't it? It's incredible. The, the longer yes. values and things. And he isn't here, non est hic. Yeah. He's gone. He's yeah. gone. It's, and the other piece, Ave, um, Virgo Sanctissima, is, was probably the most famous piece of the period from mm. the Spanish school. More, more famous than anything Victoria wrote yeah. at that time. And much imitated by many composers. Yep. I mean, it's an exquisite piece. And of course, the canon that goes through the, the high parts is, is right. And he was a very versatile composer, wasn't he? I mean, like we can segue on to Lassus actually from this, talking about incredible versatility in terms of stylistic and also in terms of genres of music. I mean, whereas Victoria wrote exclusively sacred music, essentially, um, mm. Guerrero yeah. did write a lot of a lot of genres, and Lassus yeah. particularly traveled all over the place writing, you know, filthy tavern songs, as well as this incredibly esoteric highbrow music. So um, could you talk about the Alma Redentoris, another one of the Marian answers? Yes, yeah, so, and we start with that. And it's um, it's actually an eight voice piece, not really double, it is double choir. In a, so we stage it double choir. Mm. And there are, there is a sense of one side and another side answering yeah. each other. But uh, it's not, it's basically an eight part piece, mm. an eight part counterpoint running all the way through it. And um, this is very dramatic, surgere, the rise up, uh, yeah. uh, beautiful, a wonderful piece of what I call orchestration, but it's sort of vocal orchestration mm -hmm. at the end, where he hits the last chord, eight part chord, and then he moves two of the parts within that chord and creates a completely different buzz inside the, so it's sort of regroup, regrouping. And, and uh, using the sonority of the chord in a new way. That is an amazing thing, isn't it? With, I mean, especially a group like yours who can do all these things so fantastically, where the fifths lie, mm. and you just move one to actually have a, a low down third, it completely changes the kind of euphony of the whole thing. I love especially, those low down thirds. Amazing. They, they, we actually put them in sometimes. Ah, I love it, yeah. yeah. Or, or the low fifth as well. Yeah. Sometimes when you've got a strung out chord at the end, it's very effective to put the fifth in. Yeah. Um, well, without, old, without, old, without permission. It's an old organist trick, isn't it? We always do that at the bottom. Do, yeah. fake, <laughs> fake fifths at the bottom. So, yeah, that's terrific. No, but I you're trust right. you to something, do that. Ed. Something yeah. about the sonority, you know, it amplifies the overtones and it makes things work so very beautifully. Um, and it is interesting because, as you say, it's an eight-part piece and it, it shows some sort of gestures of the polychoral technique in Italy at the time in Venice. So he'd obviously learned some of that, but it's not, as you say, a double choir piece in the sense that it's antiphonal because there is genuine eight part counterpoint going throughout it all. Yes. I think Lassus is just a fascinating composer, isn't he? Absolutely incredible. He's, he's uh, the, I don't know, there's no one else anything like him as experimental, as, as competent in 
the number of motets he wrote. It's I mean, just insane. Hundreds and hundreds of them. Absolutely extraordinary. We'll never know it all. No one's ever going to get the breadth of Lassus. It's too yeah. much. It's just remarkable. But thank yeah. you for all you do for Lassus. And so let's come on to Isaac now, another really mm. fascinating composer. Mm. Um, can you talk a little bit about him as a composer and also about this in incredible piece that you're doing? Well, Isaac was the great sort of competitor, really, of Josquin. And they were reckoned to be more or less on a par at the time. They went to the same jobs mm. and Isaac tended to get them because he cost less. <laughs> Do you remember that? But he wasn't reckoned to be, he, he only, he, Josquin would only write when he wanted to, whereas yeah, Lassus would write when he was asked to. Yes, and this made yes. a big difference. But Josquin, nonetheless, was the cat. Mm -hmm. so, but one is always putting the two up against each other and their styles are fascinatingly different mm -hmm. I can't describe this very easily but the way Isaac thought and, and wrote things down on, on, on his manuscript is quite different from Josquin. and he doesn't think in those mathematical ways or he, if he does it's not clever it's just structural there is something that even when it is very strictly canonic it doesn't sound like just like exercising counterpoints not that Josquin does, but there, there's something very, I don't know, that kind of, the, it's amazing art kind of hides its art in that old saying. Uh, yeah. It seems to me. Well, um, in this particular, and he's very good at ceremonial motets, Isaac. He, he was asked by all the potentates of that time, the Pope, the Emperor, everybody, to write the big piece for the big occasion, the big summits, what we call political summits these mm -hmm. days, that they had in those days. Mm -hmm. And uh, Isaac was often asked to, to write the big piece. And this is one of those big pieces. And it actually refers to the Emperor Maximilian. It refers to the fact that he's the, um, the king, the duke, I can't remember, emperor, the emperor of Austria, Austriarche, comes into the text. And, you know, any modern politician would be thrilled to bits to be hymned with music like this. I mean, it is so big making. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very yeah. grand. It is very grand indeed, and gives the sense of yeah, exactly of, of, of the grandeur, so-called, of the of the of the person receiving the dedication. Is there anything yeah. specific in that piece that it is a glorious piece that that sticks out for the listeners? Well, the very the ending of it, which we which mm. which we actually play up in a slightly naughty way, you could say, um, they're electing in in theory, electing, you know, like. <laughs> Some elections take place these days. It, it, yeah. it, it, you're electing the Holy Roman Emperor, and uh, it ends with the the tenor part. One of the tenor parts shouting out, "Elector is he is elected," mm. and I get a baritone to do this and to and to sing very very strongly. Excellent. As the chords to sort of hang there while he's going, "Elector is." That's fantastic. <laughs> like no, it's, it's, it's amazing, and you're right. I think some politicians might need to jump on the bandwagon of getting contemporary yeah. composers if they will, if they're willing to do that as well. Exactly. I think that's the that's the program, which is a terrific program, Peter. Is there anything uh, in closing that you'd like our listeners to pay attention to? Well, I think that I mean it ends with this electing of the Holy Roman Emperor. I can't think of anything grander or more exciting. That I, so stay to the end. Stay and and, you, and you'll, get the, you'll get the big buzz. I think everyone will, and especially in that amazing acoustic that is St. Paul's in Harvard yeah. Square. So I want to remind you all that Friday evening, 8 p.m., uh, the wonderful Peter Phillips and his amazing Talis Scholars will be in St. Paul's Church, Harvard Square, with this amazing Marian programme. Peter, a pleasure to talk with you as ever, and I wish you good luck for the rest of the tour, and we'll see you on Friday. Thank you very much, Ed. It's been Thank a you very much. Thank you.